We will continue today with uh, taking a look, bless you. Uh, I continue kind of going through the review of section by section, the types of things, the formulas. Um, I have added to the review resources, so we'll look at that. Basically, this is our focus. Uh, we'll make Friday a very open, come and ask questions. I basically won't prepare anything. I'll just show up and be here to help you work through any questions you may have. Uh, if we have some, what, so basically you're driving Friday. If you've got questions, come, we'll, I'll, I'll follow your lead, uh, which gives us that kind of a open review day. And um, I think we got down to about 9.2. So we're gonna pick up with about 9.3 and just kind of review the last few sections. Um, so again, you've got this, there is the, this recording for Monday. Uh, I'll go ahead and open this up or actually I'll download it. So I've got it. Um, we'll take a look at a few of those. These are your instructions. This is an exam cover page. You'll see it again, but if you want to kind of really scan it, read it so that when you do get the exam, you don't have to too much. You've already seen it put your name on it and you're ready to go. Um, so, and if you have any questions about any of what's on here, uh, you can ask those. And then this is the lecture excerpts. Uh, so I, I've added to it. It's a Google doc. So it'll take you here. We kind of got through, and, and as you see, it's, it's kind of a shortened version from the lectures that we've done previously. Uh, we went over those, and I think this is about where we left off. Did we do this? Number of heads of Bernoulli trials. I think we did it. We'll go back. Yeah, and so we'll start. Did we do this? Did we do an example with this? Okay, so almost got there. So we'll, we'll start here, um, which will lead us in. Um, let's see. Did we get, I guess maybe I better back up. Did we did? Did we talk about finite random variables on Monday? Maybe we didn't quite get there. Days there. I think we left off with the tree diagram, right? So, okay. So, and we won't get into too much detail. I think this last one, yeah, we maybe created it here. Um, but the structure for the tree diagram, so conditional probability, remember, is we know something happened. And so whenever we're talking, oops, yeah, open it up. Uh, so when we're talking conditionals, uh, we're starting really, what's the probability once we got through the first phase? Something's already happened. Or we're thinking, if it had already happened, what are now our probabilities? So it changes either, so we're told something like either A happened or A didn't happen. Um, and then we can go, if A happened, then this is the probability of, of T happening, some other event, or T not happening. Um, and we had the multiplication principle that if we take the first step probability of A, that's the probability of T, given that A happened, then we get the probability of the intersection, right? Um, so we can set things up like that. Now in Bayes' theorem, what we end up dealing with is we're going to switch the uh, base term basically takes something like the probability of t given a, and we're going to be able to find the probability of a given t. So it switches the order of things um, that now t has happened, what's the probability of a happening? And if we've got this tree diagram, we're able to do all of that. Um, because probability of A given T is, according to this formula, based upon the probability T given A, right? So there's, this is one of the branches. 
that that a has happened m and t so the probability of a and so then you have the two branches you bracket up here of t happening either a happened or a didn't happen so those two are the total of everything that happened here right a happened so that's the that's the universe we're going to divide by those two and then in the numerator, notice there's always one that's the same. Okay, so this probability of t given a times the probability of a, these two numbers here are the same. And then we just in the denominator have that additional part. So that's all Bayes' theorem is. We can apply it to three branches. Uh, it just gets more complicated. And that's why we use Bayes' theorem. Um, we're just going to have you do it with two items because... That's good enough, you understand it. But just know in your career you may, um, real world stuff comes at us with more than just A or B, right? A, B, C, or D. But it can apply for four things, five things, and, and so forth. But it's just basically, you're adding everything in the bottom. There's always just one thing in the numerator. That's what we're looking for. Um, and that's gonna be a change from, from like here. Uh, knowing the probability of T given A we're able to calculate the probability of A given T. So we're able to, let's flip it. Let's see, what if this happened first? We can do those calculations, okay? Um, and there's some, some of the homework in here. Let's see. Let me take a look at that. Let's take a look. Downloaded. So that would get you uh, basically down into here, eight point six base theorem. Um, so six and seven, you can do it with the tree diagram. You can set it up here. So these are good uh, types of questions. What I want, what I'm going to do is kind of focus on trying to get through. We can come back and whatever time we have left, maybe do a little bit of review. But I'll also, uh, I'm also taking two graduate courses for fun. I mean, I'm done. I'm not getting a new degree, but. Um, One's on community college, the American Community College. So it was taught by a community college president. And uh, I've worked in community colleges for a long time, but I wanted to get another perspective. So I took it. Um, that's tonight. And then tomorrow night, I'm taking one on indigenous water stories, writing. So I wanted to learn how to write. I found out I kind of know how to write, but it was kind of like more freedom to write, not academically, but um, culturally. Uh, so those are good, but those end tonight and tomorrow, so I'm done after that. So Friday, I'll start to have more time, and I'll start doing these videos individually. So, um, and I'll, as I go back, but as you have questions, that's it's always helpful. I, some those of you who have stayed behind and had questions during office hours, if you haven't, that's fine. But those who stay, you're actually helping me as well because I get to see where the questions are, right? So. Um, if you get questions, or if you send me an email with a question, that helps me because I can see what people are not understanding. I can explain it and say, oh, you should, this is a great understanding. Nope, it's not. I missed something. You'll let me know what I miss. Okay, so we're there. Um, and, and basically, if you do one of them, you'll be fine. And so now we're, we're kind of ready to get into these probability distributions. Um, notice we don't have to make them from scratch, but if we're given one that's partial, uh, how do we go about doing that? Okay, so where is my, here. So again, go back and review the Bayes theorem stuff as you need, uh, but it's about one question. And some of these, the other part is don't get too stressed out about what you don't know if it's one or two things, right? Uh, still focus on what you do know. Try to get after it, but don't, I, because sometimes we start looking at, we're so focused on trying to learn this thing that we're struggling with that 
we don't spend the time on the other stuff. And if we just dropped it, we're probably fine. We're probably still like, you know, okay, I missed four points. What's the big deal? But if I focus on it and I, you know, it's just not speaking to me, I could lose many points because I didn't get to those other things that I, I would have done well in. Um, so, okay. So here we go with the finite random variable. So this is, this came back, uh, and this will take us through the rest of the course, really. What we started to do is this concept of a, a random variable is we've been using it, right? We just didn't call it that. So this will start calling it that. Um, and all it is is that there's a, some values, like we roll a dice and we call it a one, two, three, four, five, or six. X equals one, two, three, four. That's a random variable. Well, we've kind of been, when we talked about rolling a dice, did you get a six? We just didn't call it a random variable, but this is what it is. It's randomness. So um, here's one. There's four different states. There's a zero, one, two, and three. Those are the values that something happens and you know that's that's the outcome. This could be a, a game and you get zero points, one point, two point, or three points. Um, and so this was uh, flipping a coin three times and counting, and so the the random variable is how many heads did you get? So you could get zero heads if you flipped it three times. You could get one head, two head, or three head. And so, um, you know, here's the actual, this is sort of how we dealt with it when we're just doing probability. When we start talking about random variables, we, we just kind of break it all down to zeros, one, two, and three. But we still have to kind of go back to the you know, flipping coins and what is there? Because how many ways can we get two heads, right? There's more than one. And so that helps us set up the probabilities that there's actually three ways to get a one, three ways to get a two out of eight possibilities, only one way to get a three heads and one way to get no heads. So then that tells us what's more likely to happen. Um, so more likely to get one or two heads. Okay, so then we can set up these probability distributions so we did a little bit of that. Um, notice, I'll just highlight it here. Uh, but one of the things, because this, this runs through it, is that when we add all these together, they have to add to what? One, which is, think of it as 100%. Because otherwise I think one, what is one? One's just a number, right? But it's 100%, it's everything. So this has to, we have to include everything in this distribution. If it doesn't add to one, is we're not going to talk about it, right? Because it, then it's not a probability distribution. We've left something out. If it's more than one, it's not a probability distribution. So from here on out, pretty much everything has to fit this sort of phase. Okay. Now oh, there it is. It has to add to one. Um, here's rolling a die. Has six sides. Either comes up one through six. And again, all the probabilities are one sixth. Uh, if we were rolling two die, then we'd have 36 different possibilities. Well, not, we'd have a, you get a two to a 12, so those possibilities, but there's 36 ways for those to happen, and we had to count, you know, there's, but there's, and remember with that, because uh, there'll be a question about rolling two die, just remember that, pro that sort of table of a red die and a green die, there are six ways to make a seven, there's five ways to make a six, and so just kind of that table goes down diagonally. If you think of seven, you just subtract one, you get there's six ways to make a seven out of 36. How many ways to make a six? Subtract one, there's five ways. So just remember that. Um, and then if you go the other way, eight is gonna match with the six. Um, so those things. Now we're here, okay. So this though was a little bit different if we have a Bernoulli trial a binomial. Binomial means what? Bi means two different ways to, you know, and so you either, there's only two things that can happen. You either succeed or you fail, right? It's not partially fail, not partially succeed. <laughs> you either succeed or you fail. So you get a heads or you get a, or you don't get a heads, right? You roll a three or you don't roll a three. So it's, it's all based upon success or failure. Um, some of this other stuff is not, it's, you know, there's different states, you know, you can have a car accident that's not so bad, kind of bad, really bad, but um, 
Bernoulli, you just have two things. And so here they, you know, they lay it out. Uh, usually we'll focus on the probability of a success we call P and the probability of a failure or the other thing happen we call Q. And uh, remember that uh, one minus P, uh, that's what Q is going to be. So if we know the probability of one thing happening, we can calculate the probability of 70% chance of rain, 30% chance there is no rain. So success failure. Okay. And then when we calculate the probabilities, we just end up having to, you know, however many trials there are, this would say we're going to have two successes, so P squared. We're going to have three failures, Q to the third power. Uh, but then we always get this combination thing of how many different ways there are for a success to happen, right? So out of five rolls with two successes, that's a multiplier, which is going to give us the full thing. And sometimes that's the part we forget. Oh, just probability of success times the probability of failure, just multiply them all together. But remember, even though order's not important, there's multiple ways for that to happen. So that takes care of that, okay? And so they just go through it. But just, yeah, this is, a, this is an important part to come back to. And just as we go forward, we'll start seeing, we'll talk about mean and standard deviations and depends on the type of probability problem we have, right? If we have a, a distribution with many different things happening, we do that one way. If we have a binomial with just two success and failure, everything's much easier. That's why we sometimes do this. Um, and it's actually still very powerful, right? You know, computers are based on success failure, right? Zero, ones and zeros. It's either on or it's off. There's a lot we are able to do with this sort of simple approach of we either succeed or we fail. Okay. So that's in there, sort of kind of review. And again, we'll get into a few of the, the questions a little bit later. Um, but also, what I want is to kind of get you today just thinking about what you need to study. You kind of need to go through these on your own. And, and I'll have, you know, again, the recorded solution guide and go through. What I do want to do here, though, is now we're starting to get more into statistics. I want to show you, I don't think I did what I may have said I was going to, but uh, I want to show you how to use a stat function on a TI-84. The Casio will have one similar, but um, we'll just focus on this for now because um, this is a valid way to do this. Instead of figuring out how do I calculate the mean, the standard deviation, variance, all those sort of things, Calculator does it all in one step. So all we have to do is enter these data into the calculator. So let me show you. Um, again, it, let's see. Oh, I got to take that off. Let's keep these things for now. Let's 60, 50. I think I can get them all. I get most of them. Okay, so I'm going to just clear this out to me. So this is a statistic, so there's a button that says stat. So we're going to push the stat button. All the statistics, you have to give it your data. Well, that's the edit part. So we're going to edit, give it our data. Then we'll do the middle thing, which is calc. Um, there's also some tests you can do, but uh, primarily what we'll do is we'll use the calc function here. So I'm going to go to edit. I've already got some data in here. I don't want it. So I'm going to go, I arrow up to the L2, which is list two. I think I hit clear and then enter. And notice all the data is cleared out. Don't hit delete because then the whole list goes away. And then we can get it back for you, but that's why I have to always remember. I probably shouldn't have even said that because now you're going to no, just use the clear. And then the same thing for list one. I go over to the list. I go up to the title. I hit clear and enter, and my lists are clear. What I'm going to do is in list one, I'm going to just put all my data. So I'm going to do 60, enter 50, and it just goes down this list, 55, uh, 0, 100. Let's see what else is in here. Over here. 90, 40, 20. 90, 40. 20, then 40 and 70. 
And yeah, you have to put each one in individually because again, if you leave one off, then the calculations will be off, right? So it needs all these numbers, it needs them all in there correctly. And that's usually the hardest part I have is making sure they're all put in there. I make some kind of entry error. So we got to check that. Then what we do is we hit the stat button again. And then we're going to come over to calc. And what we're doing is called one variable statistics. We're just putting in all this data we collected, which is, um, I don't even know what it was, but um, some opinion or whatever, so our score on a test. We've got our data in there. Uh, we're going to do one variable statistics, and it gives us all the answers we would ever need. So then we talk about, well, not yet. We're going to use list one frequencies. If you had more than one frequency, you could do that. And then we calculate. Um, okay. Now, it's this X bar, what does that mean? Good. Um, and again, it didn't matter whether a sample mean or, prop, or population mean, that's, the calculation is always the same. It does give us the sum of Xs, which we don't need, but if we, were go we could use that to do some calculations. We don't need that. We don't need the sum of the X squareds. Uh, again, sometimes there's some statistic stuff where you do use that. We don't. Um, now, there's two standard deviations here. What do you think the S little x is? What kind of standard deviation is that? It's a little bit bigger than this one. So there was two types of standard deviations, right? One was from the sample, one was from the population. And that's key because if we gave you this data and they want the sample, which one of those is for the sample? Sample starts with an S. So that's how it, so sample starts with an S. So the one with the S is 30 because, and remember the formula is in minus one. They're dividing by a smaller number. I think we had eight things there. They are dividing by seven, right? The popul if this was the population, if it was everything, then we would use the, the sigma X. This is the population standard deviation, and it's going to be a little bit smaller. And remember, I told you, if you get to about 30, it won't make much of a difference at all. Because that's sort of the, so if you get into any research, they like to encourage you, if you can, get 30 sub subjects and stuff. Because if you get 30, you're going to be about close, to, the calculations are like close to being a population. But not always. There's some things we're doing that's qualitative too. Okay, so that's there. N is 10. Actually, it's not 10. So we have 10 things. The sample uh, standard deviation was calculated using 9 instead of 10. Okay, uh, And remember, it's already taken the square root. We, it doesn't really show us the variance. Uh, so that's, I guess, one thing that's sort of missing. We could get the variance from the stuff it gave us, but uh, it doesn't. Uh, and then we don't do all of this, but they've got the mean and they've got, or the median. They've got the minimum. They've got a five number summary. Uh, so we don't use most of this stuff, but uh, if you take a stats class, I just want you to know it's there. Uh, a lot of times we use that with uh, like housing data that's skewed. So marketing, especially, a lot of times you'll use me, uh, median and uh, five number summary rather than mean and standard deviation. But in this class, we're focusing on the mean standard deviation. So it's all there, but you've got to know which one is which. And the, sta the standard deviation thing, these two can cause the biggest problem especially on a multiple choice test, because they'll probably list both of them. And you're going, oh, which one is it? It's, uh, again, if it's a sample, typically it's a fewer numbers, and that's going to be actually a little bit bigger. Uh, okay. And what does all this mean? It means if this was a test score, the average score was 52. Standard deviation is about 30. <laughs> that means 52 to 80. So there was a lot of variation in this class, you know, so this, this test. And you saw that there was someone got a zero and someone got a hundred. Uh, so there's a lot of variation in this. Um, we okay with that? Okay, so a little practice and, you know, some of these things, if you don't remember, I just, I'll forget things and I'll just look up TI calculator statistics. And you'll see people do videos, short videos that you can watch and learn. Uh, so that's there. But you can do that um, as you go through. Uh, I want to have a little word about uh, showing your work. Okay, I know in the academic world we kind of we want you to show your work so you can prove to me that you understand. What I'd like you to do is think about how much work you would need to do so that if you came back a couple days later, you know what you did. 
That's how, that's the judgment I really use. Sometimes I'll come back and say, how'd I get that? Damn, I didn't put enough work in. I didn't show enough work. Uh, if I, sometimes I'll look back and I know exactly because it's, you know, it's all here. And so that's okay. You know, I, I, I figure I've done enough. But, you know, leave some trails so that when you look at it later, you'll know how you got there. Because um, there are some things we do mentally. And again, there's cultures that value that. And, but the academic culture kind of wants everything in writing. But sometimes when we put things in writing too much, that's where things scramble, at least for me. If I write too much, I actually have more problems because you know, I make copy errors and this and that. But if I, I find my medium, what works for me, I put enough so that I can remember what I did and I could explain what I did, that's good, right? You don't have to prove to me, but sort of prove to yourself that you could come back and you can reconstruct what you did by what you wrote, okay? And it may be, you know, little picture of a button, stat. I hit the stat button. I, I edit. I, you know, so um, some of those things. Okay. Uh, finite random variable. So we're going to bring a couple in. I guess I didn't have the, the thing working. So uh, we do have distributions. Uh, so here's the, X, the, the random variable is either negative 1, 0, 4, or 5. So that might be, again, a, a lottery game or something. If you buy a ticket, so you could lose $1 if you don't win anything. Uh, maybe you win a dollar back, so then that's zero dollars net to you, uh, or you could win four or five dollars. And if you won four dollars, it means actually you probably got five because you paid a dollar or something like that. And then we've got the probabilities there. Um, and then to get expected value, remember what we do is we multiply the random variable. So when we have this whole thing going along, you multiply the random variable times its probability random variable times its probability, random variable times its, you do it for all of them, and then you add it all together. And then this one would say that the expected value is 0.6, which is positive. And again, if this was a game, it just tells you if you played it a lot each, on average, you would win 60 cents each time. So yeah, I should, I should go ahead and keep playing this, right? If I played it a thousand times, a thousand times 0.6 means on average I'd win 600 bucks, right? So this is a, a good game. Most lottery or gambling games are not set up like that, okay? But that's expected value. If I've got a binomial distribution, again, what's, a, what's the difference? Binomial only has two outcomes, success, failure, right? This one up here has four different outcomes, so that we have to go with weighting each of us. When we have a, a Bernoulli, this is a simple calculation. How many, uh, what's the expected value? Notice it's really just going to take the number of times you play it times the probability of a success, okay, n times p. We don't even have q in there. That gives us our expected value for a binomial distribution with multiple attempts. So far, so good? Okay, so, you know, not, as I'm going back too, sometimes we went through all of this, but it was kind of spread out. Now we're going side by side, you say, okay, there's two different ways to calculate the mean. And if there's these two different ways, how do we calculate the variance? Now, the one thing I want, when we get into the calculation, do we ever use the variance? No, we don't, so why did we calculate? It's a stepping stone to get to the standard deviation. As soon as we got the variance, what do we do? We take its square root and that's what we use. That's the, the uh, but it's, it's, oftentimes a part of the process. Now, I'm just gonna show you there's this, you know, this is if, uh, how we get to the variance, if we have that, like four different things or five different things, right? You've gotta take each random variable, you've gotta subtract the mean and you've gotta square it, and then we divide by however many they are. That was for population, um, actually it's for data in general. And then when we get, again, we don't use the variance, uh, we take its square root, and then we've got the standard deviation, right? This is with data. And again, if it's data, just put it in the calculator. The calculator is going to take care of all of that for you. Because um, what you find is in, in statistics, the more important thing is what does it mean? How do I use it? And oftentimes if we focus just on how to calculate it, we, we, we could calculate it, but we forget what we're getting. Okay? Remember, this is sort of the average deviation 
from whatever the mean is. Okay, so that's with the that's with the population. Population's everything. Most of the stuff we deal with is really in samples. Uh, again, it's right about 30 that you get the crossover. So if we're doing a sample variance, we divide by n minus one just to it makes it a little bit more accurate. And again, that's all into the theory of statistics that uh, we won't go into because I don't know about it. You know, it's, you have to get to the graduate level of statistics, which I didn't do. Um, I did some, but um, I wasn't interested in it. It just it is what it is. So just use it, and I'm more practical. Yes. Do, yeah, do it in the way that you could tell what you did. Okay. Am I going to be looking for this? Get the right answer, circle it, and show me some supporting work. Yes. I want, I teach from, a, I was talking to someone earlier. I, I, I wish this class had more application, practical application problems, and that's, one thing next time I, I, I would bring in a few other of those because it's how you use this stuff that's more important, right? Um, if, if understanding, if busting this out by hand was made you, you know, was really helpful, again, for a math major, maybe, because that's what we're trying to get you is the math, you're business majors, so um, use it. It doesn't hurt to kind of go and understand these things, but it's also, it can it takes time and I don't want it to hold anyone out. So if you've got a method, I also don't philosophically believe in testing people on methods. And again, we've got sometimes we're doing versus two, three, four different methods. One of them is using the calculator. You can get one of those methods. I'll, I'll support you on that. Yeah, I know. And again, we take the square root once we get the variance. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, Getting the standard deviation for a probability distribution, right? So I put this one in here because it shows sort of how you could do all the steps. And sometimes like this one, you can't just plug this one into the calculator because the calculator doesn't have a real good feature for it. But it has sort of the steps. And, um, you know, again, we take, we're taking here the random variable times its probability, that's how they're getting this number. And then they add it all together, right? And divide by um, however many there were, or actually what they just, no, this one, uh, this takes care of the probability, does it? So they add them all together. And we get our, our average our expected value, the 30. And then they just show you right here, then you take each x value, which would be 10, and you subtract the mean, so 10 minus 30. So it's just kind of, this is telling you what it's doing. And then you take each of these numbers and you square it. So negative 20 squared is 400. And then you take each of these numbers times the probability that it happens. So this is 40, 400 times 0.2, which gives you 80. And then you add all these together. And that gives us the variance, but we don't use the variance. What are we going to do to the variance? We're going to take its square root, and then that's the standard deviation. So this is a little bit longer process. It, it, you still have to understand the process. This one, okay, yeah, you got to show some work. I have to show some work because otherwise, you know, probably not going to get it right if you don't write some things down, right? So, and this, I like this, this process of just saying, okay, these are the steps. Here we are. But if I just got numbers, I can just put in my calculator and, and get it. And we'll be fine. Um, okay, so that's with a probability distribution with multiple things that could happen, but more than two, so three, four, five, right? You have to do all of them. You have to get each of those probabilities. What if we have a binomial? It'll be much easier because it's either success or failure. So a binomial, this is the one I really like, uh, is just NPQ. You're just multiplying three numbers, right? 
And again, I plug it in on a calculator. I'm not good. You don't have to. Yeah. See, there's too much. Uh, there's some things we just do. And again, but we have to recognize when I do MPQ, that's not the standard deviation. That's the variance, which we're not going to use. What do I have to do to get the standard deviation? I have to take its square root. So MPQ. Remember, the mean was just n times p from the previous one. So you start seeing, well, binomials. I hope they give me a lot of binomial questions. Those are a lot easier. Um, but thinking through them sometimes is a little bit hard. So far, so good? Yeah, I was going to even change some of those, especially in the review part. But um, yeah, just do, do what you, focus on getting an answer first, doing it. And then again, like I said, is just think, let me think of what notes I would have to do so I could, when I come back in two days, three days, or next semester, I would know what I did. And you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Uh, we went through a couple things. There was an empirical rule. There's also some other guy's rule. I can't remember his name now. I didn't put it in the slide deck, but there was one question that you had to use it. I think it was like, uh, in general, a, a non-normal distribution was like 75% were between two standard deviations. You won't have to know that one. Okay, On the test, they just focus with the um, normal distribution. So there's this. Um, empirical rule, or so it's, it's general, and you're going to see that it's really it's just rounded. Uh, so 80 or 68 percent are between one standard deviation, so one standard deviation plus or minus a standard SD, and 95 percent are plus or minus two standard deviations. Okay, so there may be a couple questions that just ask you to apply this this uh, empirical rule. <coughs> But we're going to also ask you about finding the area under the curve uh, with probability distributions in general. One of the things you want to always remember, it always adds to 1, right? All the probabilities are going to add to 1, which is 100%. If they don't, it's not a probability distribution. So we did some of that. And then also we're interested in if we have two sort of endpoints, what would be the probability of getting our random variable somewhere between A and B? We can calculate that. And we do that with the um, with the integral. So again, this was the uh, the rules. Um, the integral from you know start to finish has to add to one, and that all the pro every probability has to be greater than zero. You can't have negative probabilities. Okay. So if if this graph went down below the x-axis, that would make it negative. So th those don't those aren't probability distributions. Um, we did some of that of deciding whether something was or wasn't. That was just to get you ready. We're not going to test you. We're not going to give you a test question asking you to identify whether it is or not. So we'll give you things. Uh, we also talked about uniform distributions. So there's a few places where that comes in. What's a uniform distribution? Like rolling a die, all the probabilities are the same. So if all the probabilities are the same, things are equally likely, rolling a die, flipping a coin. Actually, flipping a coin, since there's only two, we can use the binomial, which is always easier. Uh, but like rolling a die, that's something that is uniform. Doing a spinner that has maybe 12 slices on it, and they're all equally likely, that's a uniform distribution. So we, we, we get basically a rectangle, right? And the area under that rectangle from A to B would be equal to 1. Um, and we can calculate any particular uh, area under there. Um, but the function is just beginning minus 1 over B minus A. Uh, normal density, density function. So the normal curve uh, has this sort of funky function. And again, remember, we can plug it in. I did add one thing here, and this is what I did. Is I, I said, well, remember, I, this is what I had in my calculator because, you know, that looks real complicated. And you write that down. How did Little Crow just come up with this? Well, that's when the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. So everything has been standardized. And that's what we'll primarily be using. So it becomes a simpler equation. If we put this in, you'll see, you'll actually get the graph of the normal curve. And you can 
integrate between two points and you can get, uh, which are Z values, and we can get that. And there was also another way, um, so let me just highlight that. And the other thing, the reason I want you using the calculator, because that's how you're going to solve it. And if you just focus on trying to do it all by hands and by tables, you won't remember how to use the calculator. If you get using the calculator regularly, you'll remember how to use it. Um, so let's do this. For, let's see. Yeah, we're, we'll get a little bit. I just have a couple. So, oh, good. I've already got it in there. God, I still had it there. I'm going to clear this one out. I don't need this one. And remember, um, what I do is I leave this I leave this in here, but it's turned off, so it's not going to graph. I can use this calculator to do other stuff. But if I want to use it, I just come over here and hit Enter, and now you'll see it's it's highlighted, so it will graph it, right? And remember, thinking this is a standard normal curve, so what kind of a window do I want to look at? Well, let's go from negative four to four. So x is negative 4, that's 4 standard deviations to positive 4 standard deviations. I'll get a good view. And the height, um, you could do almost anything you want, but actually I think 0.5 is plenty high. Um, and then when we graph it, this is the normal curve. So having that in there, and I'm okay if you just kind of leave it in. Um, we get this, and then let's say we want to find the area one standard deviation below to one standard deviation above. Remember, we go second calc. This is where we use our calculus. We're going to integrate, and we get the lower bound and the upper bound. So whatever they are, whatever those numbers are, I'm going to go from negative 1 to positive 1. And does anyone know about what I'm going to get? We should. The empirical rule, 1 below to 1 above, 68. Actually, I'll get 68 point something, but uh, that's what you'll see. The empirical rule just basically rounds it. So yeah, 68.6826, you know, so empirical rule just asks, call it 68%. Okay. So you can calculate, and there's going to be questions where they ask you to do it. You can use this method. There's another method we could use, uh, and that's with the distribution. So this VARS key, notice if you shift it, it's going to be the distribution key. Uh, let me get to the main screen here. I'm going to go second distribution. If you do the second one, the normal CDF, I can't remember what CDF stands for, but I just know that's the one we need to use, not the PDF, just the CDF. Um, you hit that. You want the lower, let's go to negative one. I want the upper, positive one. Notice my mean is zero and one. If you've got a question where that's not what it is, you could change those, right? And you just go down, and now we're going to paste it in, and it gives us the same values, 0.68286, exactly the same thing. So there's two ways to do it. The, I like the first one we did because I see the picture, and it, it's all there. But after a while, I could use this one because I've got that picture sort of burned in my mind. I can see what's going on, and I say, okay, 68% are one below to one above. But this gives us a quick way to figure it out. And if I had a question that had a different mean and standard, if they gave me the mean was 20, standard deviation was five, I could use that and just go with it, right? Uh, if I were to use the graph, I'd have to come back and, um, where's my, uh, oh. I would have to come back and actually put, uh, you know, put my mean into this formula and, and edit it, and I don't want to do that. So that's why I would use that one. This one I will use when I have standard normal curve with a mean of 0 and 1, I can do it, okay? So those are two ways I'd go about it. And this is just, uh, you know, showing us the, you know, if you were to actually find it using the integral, um, we're close to 68%, 95%, 99.7. The reason they go to the extra decimal place, if you rounded that one, it'd be 100%. And it's not really 100%. It's almost 100%. But they want to, when they use the empirical rule here, they always say 99.7%. Um, because otherwise, you know, rounding, you get to 100. Okay, so rounding that one, we're still at 95, so we just call it 95. Does that make sense? Kind of. So we've got some just general rules that are kind of easy to use, but because, uh, you know, for just plus or minus one, two, or three standard deviations. Um, and let's see. Um, 
And again, we can use it. Oh, the reason I wanted to do this for you, because um, I don't want you, on, when you get the test, the very last page will have a, a full table. And I'll, I forgot to, but I'll put it in the, the resources so you'll see, you know, there's going to be this last page. I didn't teach you how to use it because, you know, I learned it, but you could spend a lot of time. Each calculation is different. You got to go through the table. I said, just use your calculator. Use the technology because that's the better way to do it. But there is going to be a table along with the test as the last page. So, you know, if some if you if you want to, you know, Friday, again, it's your drive. If you want to learn how to use it, I'll show you how to use it. Uh, but you'll see you have to kind of draw the you have to draw the normal curve on your own. And then you're doing some adding and subtracting and you're looking at multiple things. Whereas if with the calculator, you just enter it and it gives you your answer. OK, um, but this is sort of the old school way. Um, and I remember I, I was thinking, man, it's really hard to use this calculator. It's not that hard if you just look up a video and get some help, and then you start using it. So we can do all of this. But this is here just not because I want you to do it this way, just that it's going to be there. And some other people may, you know, in fact, I would have been one of those people probably about two years ago. I would have said, oh, this is an easier way. I started, I worked and figured out, how, oh, the calculator is much easier once you know how to do it. Um, and so you can get those values. Um, and then three, uh, again, we'll just kind of click through most of this. Uh, this is the last, the P3. So this will be our last new content lecture. Um, and it is basically saying to get the expected value for disability, or not disability, um, probability distribution. See how I switched the D, uh, yeah, probability distribution. Um, you can take the integral of x times the function. Now that's going to give you the mean, um, but that's different than taking just the integral of the function itself, right? The integral of the function gives us one, but x times it will give us what the mean is. Um, and so we had an example. There was different types of means. So if we had a uniform distribution, again, it's real easy. It's a plus b divided by two. So you know it's a rectangle. So it's halfway down the rectangle. That's just it. So if you if you've got a uniform distribution, watch for that. Just know that there's these differences. Uh, if you get an exponential distribution, remember we kind of worked through this, uh, e to the minus ax, you just bring that little a, negative a comes down, becomes a. Again, um, they explain it, but the average is just going to be 1 over that a. So partly recognize this. And again, there's a few questions where you could use those. Uh, there's a longer way to do it where you can actually work through it. But if you remember it, there it is. Okay, So notice we're going to use that. And then finally, the normal distribution. Well, the mean is the mean. <laughs> they will give it to you, right? And so the expected value is the mean. That's what it means. So um, I don't think we used it much, but just to show you that there's these different ways of getting it. And then variance and standard deviation based on a probability distribution, again, it, kind of follows the same thing. This is x minus the mean squared. Notice x has gone. Because remember, when we were doing, when we were finding the mean um, for a probability distribution, we had the integral of x, f of x, dx. This was the mean or the expected value from a to b. But when we go, it's, notice this x goes away. We just have the function. And then we have, we take that value, whatever this was equal to, right? That's what goes here, x minus each of these. And you do it for each of them. Um, and that gives you, again, the variation, or the variance. And then you take its square root to get the standard deviation. OK, so uh, and we'll, there's a couple problems in the review that are that way. Um, and then if there's a uniform distribution, just remember this one, you just yeah, memorize it somehow. B minus A squared over 12. By 12, well, you have to work the whole thing out. But it's, again, remember, uniform distribution is a rectangle. So it has something to do with how much it varies from there or something. Uh, but it will always be 12. So it's just kind of, and then we'll look through the review. Again, I've highlighted 23 questions. If it's not highlighted, don't worry about it, OK? If it's highlighted, worry about it. You know, do, do your best.
But again, one or two is okay to just say, because we're going to have 20 questions. I can miss one or two, and it's not really going to make much difference. But if I get them all, it's also nice. And then for the exponential, remember the mean was 1 over a. The variance ends up being 1 over a squared. So then you take the square root of this. The standard deviation is just 1 over a. So it's kind of an interesting function um, that I just thought of. So actually, standard deviation is going to be equal to... 1 over a, but remember also the mean for this thing was 1 over a. Um, and so exponential functions have these, are just, this, you know, it's a natural number, but exponential, the rate of growth is the same as the exponential itself, right? It's kind of got, it's just a very interesting thing. And the mean and the standard deviation are exactly the same for this type of a function. It's kind of, you know, Look for patterns and stuff, you can go there. And I think that's it. So that takes us all the way through the content, all these things. You know. So again, make your notes, make a few note sheets. Um, as you work through the review, anything that you're not using, you, if you got through the review, I never use that. Cross it off, so don't worry about it. Okay, we don't need that. Uh, anything that you had to go look up while you're working through the review, put that on your note sheet, right? So it's right there. So that when you go through again, you can just pull it up. Um, and again, have that available to you. Again, we can't bring notes during test time. You can bring it into here, study, 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 and then as soon as put it all away, and then it's going to be fresh in your mind. First thing I would do is on your on a piece of scratch paper on the back, and you'll have the, the back page of the test will be blank. Do a brain dump, memory dump. Everything you've remembered about this put it down there. So you have all these things, you know, that you might need. Friday, opportunity to come, ask questions, work through things. Uh, I'll still be here for my office hour. So actually Friday, you'll have a two hour. You might actually, I don't think there's any class. I, I'm substituting for another professor for a 210 class, I think at 11 or 1130. So I'll just be hanging out here. I'm not going to go anywhere. So Friday will be a good opportunity for some, so probably some extended office hours. I don't think there's a class in here up Friday after us, so we can stay and use this as long as we want. So if you've got questions, please do come Friday and we'll use that as our study session. Then you'll have the full week. Homeworks are all open. Practice until Thursday evening at 7.10. And I did get a message from a student who thought that there was a conflict and I get this from time to time because they think of the time when we meet that their other class now has a final at that time. We don't have a, our meeting time is not at class time. It is fortunately in class, but it's a very, you know, it's a different day. It's on Thursday and it's in the evening, 710. Uh, and I looked up, I couldn't find, you know, this is our common final. So the, the university does a pretty good job of ensuring that we're not going to get a conflict of time. 210 also has it. There's a couple engineering classes that have their common final at this time, but why would an engineer be taking 211? No, they're not going to. So they, they're pretty good about not getting any overlap between one. Now, it could be that you might have one, you know, three of them that day, but uh, so I'll talk, you know, we'll, we'll work things out, but it's best if uh, we can just all come here Thursday, take our tests. I'll get them graded as soon Friday as I can get things posted in Canvas so that you can take a look. And then I think I've got to have grades in by the following Monday. Yeah, grades are due by that Monday. So let them sit over the weekend and we'll go from there. All right, it's been a great journey. Again, we'll still got time. Come Friday if you need. Uh, hang out here for office hours if you'd like. and. Uh, Enjoy. Stay safe and hydrated, though, in all this heat. Thank you.